Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to Tia Know the Lessons of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and if you would like to read about the Lord's Word, for all to hear, please go right ahead. This happens pretty much every single time we play in the Far East, but it is Heaven's Hymns that we sing. We get a little bit more war sport, but it does hurt us quite a bit with all those peasant uprisings. Oh, that's not good, but we have a lot of political power, or a good amount, and currently the Divine Mandate of Siberia is justifying against us. Our, we have moderate Japanese support. And we're kind of saving political power and waiting just to go kill off these guys. Oh, never mind. Here we go. And we shall begin with a focus, shall we? The war in the north. The perfidious, heretical preacher based in the north has done much to disrupt our unification efforts, going so far as to invade our territory and rouse the peasants against us. Alexander Ben. It's little more than a jacked up priest squatting in freezing churches, and yet somehow each of his followers fight with the zeal of a dozen disciplined soldiers. We need to deal with the poisonous preacher as soon as possible. For we don't. Who knows how far his influence will reach? He's certainly popular with the rural populations, and rumor abounds that his agents have already infiltrated churches and factories. Action must be taken, both military and political, to make sure that we maintain stability in these trying times, and that we extinguish the possibility that men's soldiers have a fighting chance against their own. The ruling council must be somewhat in actions decided. Call an emergency session. I might have read that one last time. It is what it is. Oh, well, and we need more manpower. Oh, my goodness. That is not good. And God and Emperor. Men's message is, ultimately, based in religion, no matter how inaccurate that message may be. On the main, One of the main reasons that he's so popular in rural areas and small Siberian villages is because of the degree of religio 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 religiosity within those that live within them. My apologies for mispronunciations and the future mispronunciations. As such, it is important that we ensure that people are aware of those whose side God is truly on, the Tsar and his faithful servants, as well as the world dangers of disobeying God and those who serve him. A massive propaganda campaign must be launched and the agents of the preacher will be rooted out. Traveling patrols complete with a state-sanctioned inquisition who should travel the lands preaching the importance of loyalty to our administration and the divine connection between God and the Tsar, as well as ensuring that no man nor no agent of men goes unpunished. For God and the Emperor, S. Nami Bog. Now, I do want to say one thing. I really like that whoever wrote this uh, description of the focus capitalized a G in God. Thank you very much. That just sounds, or makes it very bueno, we'll put it like that. Cool. Our motorizer are heading out. We've got to get down to basically what was Chum Kamchatka. And let's see if we can beat him up. How strong are our soldiers? Well, it, it would help if I gave him orders. Maybe. Good luck, guys. You're doing actually relatively okay. So, if you would like to, you can help beat him up as well. Actually, you just go all the way up north if you can. And cut them off from... Well, over here, I guess. But, you know, whatever. So after that, you guys just take as much land as possible. I think we should do relatively okay. I'm not too worried about it, but we've got an emperor, shall we? And what do we have here? Anything here? Improve Japanese relations. we got to save our PP up for the reunification of Russia. Behind enemy lines. While our inquisitors are roaming the villages, we also need to take military action. Engaging the enemy on our front lines throughout the vast entirety of the northern Siberia isn't simply practical. However, there are just drawbacks to this sort of warfare. While the asymmetric combat that men's followers have been practicing is not the style of fighting our troops are used to quite yet, it does afford us some benefits, including the ready ability for some of our troops to sneak behind enemy lines to disrupt their supply chains and hamper our enemy's ability to combat us effectively. This way, while not exactly playing fair, we can ensure that we regularly have the edge over our enemy soldiers. And besides, what's fair about war, especially when the enemy has already proved to be an existential threat? Good point. Hey, loot. I love it. <clears throat> the airbase has been lost. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, come on, man. That, that's that's dumb. Oh, we move fast enough. We, we should do it relatively okay. I don't know how many victory points we actually need, since they're already halfway to capitulation. I hope their guys are moving in very quickly. I want you to just beat them up if you can. Just move, 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 move. And they're moving as fast as they can. Obviously, infrastructure here isn't not great. Ooh. Now, where's the capital? Uh, seriously, where's the capital? Since we just took that capital down there. Um. Ah, it's all the way. Oh, good lord. That is very high up. Well, I don't, I don't like this at all. Excuse me. Excuse my voice. Rakuza is our capital. Since when? Huh. Well, at least they're infantry, not motorized. So hopefully we can do relatively okay pretty quickly. We got an emperor behind enemy lines. It's very good. No. Oh, and we got it back. All right, not bad. Very good, my friends. I love it. All right, let's go and core everything here. And we need to finish the focus tree. Or at least this part of the focus tree before we do anything else. This is probably one of the easiest times of taking out the Divine Mandate of Siberia. But... Uh, if you'd like to read about, remind them of Pugachev, please go right ahead, because it's just going to bypass, and the end of heresy, please read, oh, we'll read this one together. It was certainly no easy task, but we can finally say that the preacher Alexander Men and his followers have been completely defeated. 
Men himself is in her captivity, captured in a small Siberian village after attempting to flee from her oncoming troops. While well, the flames of his message will likely resound with her people for quite some time. Now that he's been muzzled, we can begin wiping the peasants' minds clean of the men's toxic message. Order must be restored and our authority extended permanently over the vast expanses of northeastern Siberia. Our roaming inquisitorial squads must be given local bases of operations and governmental administra administrators, bureaucrats, and political officers all must be deployed and redeployed throughout our territory. If we don't take action now, we may never be able to effectively secure a position. Celebration can wait. Good. Slightly increased scoring times. And anything else here? Uh, improve. Uh, you know, we'll do it one more time. One more time. Hey, it's high. Nice. That's actually really good. Battle of Barcelona. Happy 1965, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. Artillery would not be bad. What are we looking for? Oh, look at that. We almost have a billion in GDP. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. The Her Heretics Trial. In their attempt to unify the Far East, the White Army had expected and trained to both fight commies and fascists. Well, they not expected or trained to fight religious extremists, though, for the North. <clears throat> but the fight they had defeated them, they had. Even through defections in their own ranks, peasant rebellions behind the lines in truly difficult territory, they defeated the fanatics in the field. Further upon capturing Amalon, they had also captured their leader, the enigmatic priest Alexander Mem. At the decision of the central government, Men have been placed on trial, and the entire process has been proven far more difficult than anticipated. Because men would not speak, not a single word, through pre-trial motions, opening statements, evidence presentation, cross-examination, and the like, he had remained entirely silent. This was causing problems for the state as a whole. <clears throat> the sentiments, the sentiments that men had spoken to in such, and so much of the rural population still existed, and without any response from them, the trial increasingly looked like more than little, than little one for show. Were he to be found guilty as he had been intended and given appropriate punishment, he would no un not undoubtedly be considered by many as a martyr. And that could not be permitted if stability was to be preserved. Therefore, the decision has been made and conveyed by proper means. Men was to be found guilty on some but not all charges and given a lengthy prison sentence. <clears throat> There would be some unrest, but in time and in the government's solidified internal control, people would forget about the priest rotting silently desired in his cell. And at that point, the sentence could easily be extended indefinitely or restored to that as originally intended. Martyrdom shall be denied. We need planes, and we need we could use more artillery. Gun-wise, I think we're doing okay. I don't want to lower anti tank because we're going to make our divisions even thicker. So, good, good. We want tanks, but artillery would be really beneficial as well. Go down to two. Go up to three. There you go. Now, we could just go into the next area. Well, I still might want to get some more loot. We still might actually be able to raid them. At this point, I'm going to cut you guys down in half, actually, and do this. Because the motorized will be part of their own little group here, so. Nice. Good. End of the heresy. And you should be led by whom? Well, you, Vasarian, you sound very familiar. Cool. And you shall be led by Ch Leonid Chernyak. Cool. And the Tartu Groove. Oh, I love that. I love that movie. Well, with our triumph over fascist commies and the mad preacher in the north, you've been able to extend our authority over the entirety of the former Russian Far East. The extension of our practical authority will be an ongoing process, but for now it's time to for celebration. The white officers, with Mikhail's tacit approval, have announced the week of joyous commemoration and creation of an annual holiday to celebrate the first major step towards the unification of all Russia under the banner of our cause. Great military parades and the banners of Holy Russia have already been prepared and meticulously planned, and victory ceremonies have begun. The star himself seems pres seemed present, but notably distracted at a number of the meetings about these ceremonies, though, apparently only barely t paying attention. Perhaps it is time that we sat down with them and discussed our future together. We get more stability, XP, and the next step. Or army XP, I should really say. Good. Oh, man, I would love to be able to raid these guys. Why can't we raid them? They have no loot. God dang it. Ah. Electronics? Uh, industry, actually. Uh, I want to keep that PP, though. Ooh, we might... Yeah, we're going to need it for societal development. I'd love to do that to get another research slot, but let's finish out what we have currently. And you guys looking pretty good. Yeah, these guys are going to have to go bye-bye. How are we going to make them go bye-bye, though? Something like this. Nice. The Tsar's new groove. The next step, Tsar Mikhail II leaned against the ornate balcony, a pensive look on his face as he looked out over the frozen town of Cheetah. And the room behind him, an extremely festive and extremely loud party celebrating his victory over the war of the warlords of the Russian Far East, was well underway. Hearing footsteps behind him, Mikhail turned to see Boris Shepunov, who looked quite pleased with himself. Mikhail, he said. What are you doing standing out here all alone? Come and join us, shaking his head. The Tsar turned back towards the balcony in response. Shepunov advanced to stand beside him. Mikhail began. What's wrong? The general's jovial demeanor had disappeared. You've been so distant lately. Care to explain what's going on? 
The chart took a moment before responding. Boris, now that we, now that you've won, what's going to happen to me? Shipping off was silent for a moment. What's going to happen? Now you're going to rule the Far East, Mikhail. What do you, why do you think we're celebrating? Mikhail shook his head again. I mean, what do you and your men plan to do with me? Shipping nodded slightly, fixing him in a glare. Ah, I see. Even after all we've accomplished, you still want to go back to Australia, don't you? Speak. After a moment, the Tsar replied, No, no, I want to stay here. A wolfish smile returned to Shepinov's face with his son. Speed, good, very good. He placed the hand on Mikhail's shoulder as he turned to leave. Your destiny is here in Russia, my liege. Never forget that. Mikhail watched as a general left, returning to the party. The Tsar's thought on Shepinov's words, perhaps in a way, was right. His destiny was here in Russia, but it was also wrong. Mikhail was a Tsar, and Tsar was meant to lead, not to follow. Perhaps Russia isn't so bad. After all, look at that stability, war support, recovery rate, and cap. Nice. And my friends... Oh, do we have actually more after this? Okay, so it looks like we can probably go ahead and do what we need to do. Lessons of war outwards and... Uh, onwards and upwards. Nice. Uh, expertise gets... It. Ooh, research facilities. Increased GDP growth. Academic base. Nice, my friends. Lessons of war, of course. Examine the troops. Reignite the movement. Army professionalism. Army professionalism. Basic training. Uh, sunset of the White Cavalry. Oh, boy. And a lot of blueprints... Uh, convoys, fighters, military reforge. Not so bad. New White Army. Expand the IDC. I love that. Clearing a path. But whenever we go to the regional stage, we have to get rid of the administrative bloat first, which is quite unfortunate. Ooh. Industrial equipment begins to rapidly improve. Ooh, look at that. Nice. So, start of something special. Dinner preparations. Oh, Titan Control. Oh, boy. Faith in Mikhail. Movers and shakers. A hard-earned land. Getting our hands dirty. Security service, which hurts our cost. I'm just looking at this first, because I'm not seeing anything about administrative bloat. Which, hold on, let's, let's go and do this first. Form the Far Eastern Imperial Realm. Nice. Has the race for reunification begun? Oh, you bet it does. Or it bet it has. Alright, I want to make sure that we actually finish out all the industry stuff first. That'd be kind of nice. Now, does anything here... Dinner preparations. Oh, this, there it is. Reduces the administrative strain. I like that. So, as much as I want to do this stuff, let's start with something special. The commies, fascists, and mad cultivists finally dealt with. We have acquired tentative control over the Far East. However, unless we take decisive and focused action, there's no guarantee that we can secure that control. This is the start of something special. Something that we've worked towards for a long time, but we cannot rest. There's so much to do. We need to establish administrative establish admi an administration to remote areas of our territory, eliminating internal resistance, and set up both increasing tensions between the factions of both the government and military. Well, look at that manpower. Exactly 150,000. That is kind of impressive, honestly. Beautiful. Uh, as much as I want to do that, we can wait. Poverty. we got to get rid of the decrease in poverty. It's still going down, but it's looking a little better. Oh, oil. Oh, oil's gone. Oh, no. Well, actually, that's okay. We actually could use some of this stuff. But I want to... Oh, yeah, we're here, too. Warlord Group is gone. Boost. Cut. Boost, 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 Oh, well, maybe that's a big waste. Oh, then again, it's not a big waste. Because we want to spend as much for civilian factories for now, or civilian spending. Because you get more political power, and we need that. Oh, 5% is not bad. Not bad. And we still get... Cut in deficit. That's not bad, that national debt. The Tsar is doing a good job. Pakistan becomes independent. A morning chap. Mikhail had spent his morning wandering the gardens of his estate. Lost in thought, his mind carried a heavier burden than usual as recent revelations had caused the Tsar much grief. Was there a single man he could trust? Good morning, your majesty. The familiar voice broke the reverie. Turning, Mikhail turned to greet Ivan Mikhailov. Mikhailov, his minister of finance. Well, what a welcome surprise, Mikhailov said, beaming. Majesty, would you care to join me? I find a morning stroll is better with company. Although Mikhail did not fully understand why his minister was in his private residence, uninvited, he nodded and the two men began to walk. Unlike in both mind and outlook, minutes passed as though they were seconds while the two spoke, and the subject quickly turned to political matters. I swear, Mikhailov began, someday I would rather cast myself into lake by call and continue to haggle with our generals. Mikhail cast a brief, nervous glance around before he replied, It could be worse, I suppose. Most days they don't even listen or let me leave this house. Mikhailov's pace slow. There are many things in this land that simply do not make sense, Majesty. The military holds even more influence than you think. Mikhailov's pace slowed to a stop, and Mikhailov, or Mikhail, watched the concern as the minister cast his own nervous glance around. Ah, I fear I may, may have said too much, my Tsar. I should leave before I am missed. We should speak again soon, preferably under less conspicuous circumstances. Standing alone once again in his gardens. The troubled Tsar was more confused than ever. The plot thickens. And we're going to do our, our hard-earned land to get rid of this uh, administrative strain first. And then we'll go with Faith and Mikhail. The vast taigas, uh, taigas 
tundras and swamps of the Far East, refreshing to hike, frustrating to govern. The sheer expenses that we're now responsible for are, to put it kindly, incredibly hard to administer. However, this shouldn't stop us. If the Bolsheviks can do it, so can we. A comprehensive plan has been put forward by some of the more economically minded members who have followed us from Harbin. An extensive a series of delegated provinces, each one of them relatively autonomous, with local militias ultimately subserving to the central government will divide our lands and ensure that we're able to govern, extract resources, and defeat the few ideological hardliners who have not yet given up, because they will eventually, whether they like it or not. The revelation, and with, that, with all that said, my dear father, this shall be my final correspondence, despite all my best efforts to reach you. It seems futile to continue attempting to do so. Both you and mother remain in my thoughts and prayers. Much love, now and forever. Uh, Mikhail Andreevich Romanov. The Tsar Mikhail sat in his personal quarters looking at the envelope that contained his final letter to his father. It had been artfully enclosed within the vanilla covered envelope, the result of masterful practice and care by the Tsar. He sighed a deep, long sigh of a man preoccupied with a momentous decision, gently taking it from his desk. He left his quarters to find Fedor Orlov, his secretary. M Mr. Orlov? Mikhail asked quietly as he opened the door. Orlov, sitting at his desk just outside, stood at the Tsar's entrance. I have one more letter from my father. He hasn't responded to the others, but I've, I have to send one more. Uh, would you take care of it for me? Orlov looked at the letter and put his hand out to receive it. But as he did, meeting the Tsar's gaze, guilt overwhelmed his features. Tears welled in the young man's eyes. What is it, Fedor? The Tsar asked. Oh, my Tsar, I've done you a great injustice, Orlov replied. Orlov proceeded to tell the Tsar this whole story. Shipanov had long been paying him to deliver Mikhail's letters to himself, instead of to the post office. And on more than one occasion, he even witnessed the general burning Mikhail's letters. Hearing this, Mikhail felt something like he had not been in a long time. Rage. I see, Fedor, thank you. Mikhail did not hand the letter to Orlov. Instead, he turned, headed back into his quarters, and it wasn't heard from for the rest of the day. A flicker of emotion in the quiet of depression. Oh, good lord, that is not good to do. Oh boy, that would that would piss me off too, probably. So, an evening dinner. Tell me, your majesty, Ivan Mikhail asked, dipping a spoon into a soup, what is Australia like, or what was it like? We've hardly ever spoken about it. Do you want to know the truth, Mikhailov? The Tsar's tone was much more aggressive and authoritative than usual, and it took Mikhailov by surprise. Australia was a paradise in comparison. I hate this place, Ivan, and you know what the worst part about it? I can't leave. No matter how hard I try, there's no way out. Mikhailov was stunned. The spoon slipping from his hand, your majesty, I... <clears throat> Enough, Mikhailov roared. I'm sick of pretending everything is fine because it isn't. I can't even write letters to my family. And you know that? The other day I learned my secretary was delivering all my mail to Shepanov. Don't you get it? I'm being held hostage in a country where everyone is spying on me. It's too cold and I can't properly speak the language. Mikhailov was silent. His mouth agape. It was as if for a few moments it started to become a completely different person. After a moment, Mikhail calmed. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, he said. That was rather undignified of me. No, your majesty, you speak the truth. It is a sad state of affairs when the, even Russia's holy sovereign is nothing more than a slave to the whims of his army. You are the Tsar, the emperor of all of Russia's. The military likes to pretend that means nothing, but they have forgotten their place. You have a God-given destiny to lead, and they have a duty to follow in your wake. A long pause followed. Perhaps it is not Russia you hate, my liege, but those who have selfishly taken advantage of her glorious legacy, your legacy. The Tsar looked distant, his mind alive with powerful thoughts. Perhaps. The seeds of conspiracy are thrown. Average, very low, loyalist influence. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. I'm just looking here down quickly. We need to keep this political power because we need more loyalist decisions, so. Hmm. Civilian factory construction speed, not bad. I like that a lot. Infrastructure is not bad. Uh, but are we actually, hold on, before we even click on anything here, we need to double check and actually uh, just cast good. Uh, are we actually building anything? Technically, yes. So if that's the case, then I'm okay with doing that. But what else do we have here? Fortification, construction, land clearing. I like that a lot. That's actually really good for later on. Increase loyalist influence. Because we don't, uh, I'll play as the Far Eastern Republic again someday or Imperial Realm. But I want to go with the Monarchist path, at least for this campaign. Is low. Well, we have to keep spending political power for that. That's fine. Uh, we can close that out. We're doing okay with that stuff. And weekly stability might not be bad again, actually. Uh, yeah, that's not bad. You get more War Score 2. But I want to finish everything else here first, so whatever. A hard earned loyalty, faith in Mikhail. Or start with something special. Boris Shipunov had come to appreciate the quiet moments. <clears throat> Sitting alone in his office, a glass of vodka in hand, he reviewed the reports from his staff. As usual, they only had bad news. More reports about the insurgents who grew bolder day by day. More rumors about possible descent from the civilian, civilian administration and much else besides. It was also tiresome. The old general swiftly drowned down the glass and as the vodka stung his throat, Shipanov wondered what the Ottoman would have thought about everything. The old Cossack always had a knack for keeping his cool, even when the situation was out of control. Now Semenyov... Semyonov, Semyonov was gone, and it was up to him to clean up the mess. The general cursed himself for believing that life would become ever easier after his army's accomplishments. You should have known by now that victories usually raise more questions than they answered. <clears throat> 
Deep down, Shepanov truly missed the old days in Chita, riding out with Semenyov and his Cossacks on daring escapades across the Siberian tundra. There, at least, he knew that his enemies would face him head on. Nowadays, he, they hid in plain sight. Peace had been made, or had made Shepanov complacent, when that really needed when he really needed it was to be more vigilant than ever. Shipanov moved on to Raphael's glass. He diverted his attention away from the weariness of his day, if only for a moment. Something is amiss, but what? If you'd like to rebuy out the caffeine flow, please go right ahead, and I do have a cup of coffee here myself. Our Tsar has long been depressed and despondent, <clears throat> doing his duty only because of veiled threats and no other choice. His speech is only barely intelligible. It have long been a sore spot between the Tsar and the military. However, Mikhail has surprisingly expressed a degree of interest in his duties. With a renewed sense of vigor, he goes about learning Russian and involving himself in any way he can. It seems that our prayers have been answered. While some worry that this will lead to a more independent-minded independent Mikhail, at the end of the day, the military is still in charge. Slightly increased loyalist influence. Very good. <clears throat> um, ooh, actually, uh, let's take our uh, focus reader, because we're not going to go to war for a while. Do we have doctrine stuff? Do we get bonuses to any sort of doctrine? So we get one bonus there. So basically, we can do all of them except for one. So let's do that one. A legacy. To consider. Presenting His Imperial Majesty Mikhail II, Emperor of All Russia, Mikhail emerged from his entourage, coming within sight of the vast rows of troops that stood before him. Upon seeing their Tsar, the men stood at attention and gathered due salutes. Hail Tsar Mikhail! Despite being caught off guard by the overwhelming cry of his name, Mikhail tried to level or level best to maintain a dignified composure. The procedure went on as planned as the Emperor made his way down the row, exchanging handshakes and salutes. It couldn't help but notice that these young men looked at him with a great deal of admiration, as though he were a figure of divine status. One of the officers he had come to couldn't have been older than twenty. Hail, your Imperial Majesty, it is an honor to serve you. The young officer gave a gracious salute. Mikhail sheepishly went in for a handshake. No, no, no. The honor is all mine. I'm truly grateful for your service. The Tsar gave a slight nervous smile. He glanced back at Boris Shepanov, who was standing behind him. The old general had his arms crossed, and his impatient expression clearly indicated that he wanted Mikhail to pick up the pace. As the inspection concluded and the royal entourage made its way back to the transportation, Mikhail passed by a sight that had caught his eye. A large bronze statue depicted, or depicting a heroic Cossack warrior on horseback was prominently displayed out front of the army base. Mikhail stopped briefly to examine the bronze figure, kept captivated by the pose of the warrior. The Tsar imagined himself in his place with thousands of young men looking to him for guidance in the heat of battle a man can dream. But, uh, as much as I want to do this, we got to make sure that we have everything. Disable, disable them? No. Oh, wait, unlock more? Cool. Uh, but anyways, uh, comments. Someone recommends we try to Kutsk sometime under Yagoda? Yes, I do plan on playing it some, some, sometime as well. Someone recommends the WRRF Zykov, or Zukov? Zykov. Zukov. I will play Zukov eventually. I promise you that because actually I really want to play them and play as Kamarovo sometime. So I, all these nations I've already just brought up, I, I do a plan on playing eventually. So we'll have to wait and get there though first. No oh, luck, we had a little bit of bus. Nice. Let's start speech. Mikhail couldn't help but feel embarrassed as he awaited the tutor that was beginning to teach him Russian. He, here he was, acting as a contender for the leader of all Russia without so much as a cursory education in the language of the people he was to rule over. His advisors, and he had agreed it wasn't a good look. Mikhail knew a few words and phrases, of course. He could say hello and goodbye, agree and disagree with statements, and even ask for the bathroom. He understood Russian pretty well. Being able to follow the radio programs and speeches the government played, unfortunately, his ability to produce Russian was simply quite lacking. In truth, uh, part of him had resisted taking time to learn the language, though he had found himself changing recently. He had seen his subjects for who they really were, hardworking, caring, and accepting people. People who would band together to rebuild a farm after a raid, and house refugees from the east even if they didn't have food or money to do so. People who had accepted him. And Mikhail had also seen exactly who would rule these lands if he were to leave. Men who would have, been, who have entire villages sacked if it meant rooting out even one perceived enemy, and they all seemed to have a lot of enemies. They began to feel a resolve, a responsibility to these generous folks who had hosted him here. He was staying here for them, and every day it seemed increasingly possible that he might actually end up the ruler of Russia. He needed to be ready for that day. So there he sat, paper in hand and eye on the clock, his foot tapping as he pondered about the people of Cheetah. Suddenly, he heard the door click, and a, a man come in. He looked over to Mikhail and gave him a smile. Privet, Mikhail. Prospitium. Nice. Public visits, pu private audiences. <clears throat> With the Tsar's renewed interest in statesmanship, he has been humbly and formally requested a bore ship enough to begin receiving guests in his quarters and making public appearances to various places within the Empire to be to make himself known to the people, the elites, and public alike. After much deliberation and reluctance, and with no short amount of convincing from Ivan Mikhailov, Shipanov has agreed to allow this request from the monarch. His first audience was with Mikhailov himself, adding to Shipanov's reluctance, though Mikhail's, or the Tsar's, intent to visit and inspect the Imperial Garden Cheetah seemed to placate him. With these public visits and private audiences, the Tsar will make himself known to both the people and those within the civilian positions of power as a present and willing monarch. Oh, we love it. Nice, we could have expected that. As much as I want to do this so badly, but I think we just can't do it yet. We need more manpower, too. 
Span, span, span. Build, 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 my friends. Build. Your country needs you. Um, Imperial. Yeah, these go these divisions are pretty good. Oh, I do want to make them 20 combat with, so we're going to do that already. Nice. Planting the seeds, my friends, after we go ahead and click on this one. Ivan Mikhailov barged into the Tsar's quarters with a briefcase hastily tucked under his arm, not even bothering to knock. After peeking his head off for a quick cheek of the corridor outside, he shut the door and approached the seated monarch who had been awaiting him for some time. Are you sure you weren't followed? Did you make double sure? Mikhail inquired, nervously as he drummed his fingers on the table. I'm positive. Let's just get this over. I don't want to stay here longer than I have to. Mihailov opened his briefcase and laid several papers from within across the table, each inscribed with a list of names, clearing his throat as he took a seat across from the Tsar. The minister continued. So, let's get down to business. These are the lists of important people we'll need to get into contact with. It's very important you commit these names to memory. Who are these people exactly? The Tsar mused as he inspected one of the lists. Potential allies. If we're going to get rid of Shipanov, we'll need friends. If we can convince some wealthy oligarchs and disgruntled military men to join our cause, we will be well on the way to on the road to breaking the White Army's grip. Mikhail set his papers aside very well. If I'll see if I can't negotiate with Chip enough to allow some harmless private audiences. I suppose he doesn't need to know what goes on in them. them, them. The minister gave a d devious grin. Exactly my thinking. <clears throat> you learn rather fast, Your Majesty. Time to spin some webs. I can't wait for Penelope's web, which is uh, the next update. Well, one of the following updates for TNL. So. Or whatever may come our way. I'm always interested in learning about more Tino you know, things, I suppose. Cool. Volkogonov's clique. I haven't read that name in a while. Both Mikhail and Mikhailov has been become aware of Volkogonov, the in influential figure within the Imperial Army and old rival Shipanovs who has signaled to Mikhailov's contacts within the Loyalists' party that he may be willing to help Mikhail's plight against Shipanov and the military's hold on the administration. While it may not be easy for, to win over him, his assistance in the upcoming struggle against the interim Prime Minister and his iron grip over the Tsardom would be essential in ensuring that Shipanov and his cronies would not silence the Tsar forever. I remember my Tsar, all warfare is based on deception. Even the wars which are not fought on the battlefields, but inside palace chambers and within parliaments. Good, look at this. Infrastructure, uh, very low. We still need to increase it. I don't want to do this too much, but you know what? If we have to spend it, we're going to go with this one. Building slots are important for us because that'll give us more uh, civilian factory places to build. Factories, workshops, what do we call them? And we have no debt. The Tsar's doing a great job, in my opinion. Just maybe that's maybe maybe that's just my opinion, and maybe I could speak right, but you know, we'll see. Movers and shakers. Oh boy. Oh, so Ivan, why have you dragged us down here? I assume this isn't just a pass of time with some old friends. For a moment, Mikhailov scanned his audience carefully. After calling in favors and a few well-placed words, five of the most powerful industrial oligarchs in the Russian Far East now sat before both him and the Tsar. He would have to choose his next words with discretion. I'm afraid not, my friend. I want to discuss business. I'm well aware that all of you are chafing under the weight of the monstrous budget sink that is the White Army and are looking for solutions. Am I correct? There was a pause, a pause amongst the oligarchs before one of them. Cautiously spoke up. To tell the truth, I'm sick of it. You have no idea how much this kind of defense bank eats into a man's profits. Nothing we can do about it, though. The White Army's word is law around these parts. Our goals are aligned, then. His Majesty and I seek to curb the influence of the military and return the Empire to a civilian rule, of course. To make this happen, we'll need friends. Of that, you never ask. Just tell us what you need, and you'll have it. Just make sure that we're taken care of once this is all over, alright? The oligarch's answer was joined by several nods and agreement from his colleagues. Mikhailov glanced at the Tsar and smiled as he turned his attention back towards the businessmen. I think we have a deal, my friends. The dollar's mightier than the sword? Oh, it definitely can be. Pull back the curtain. Mikhailov has come to the Tsar with what seems to be a completely ludicrous proposal to pull back the curtain on Shipanov's puppet show in a public place to showcase the true extent of Shipanov's influence both to the public and the officers. At a public event in Chita, the Tsar would make overtures and actions that Shipanov would simply be unable to abide by. This, of course, is incredibly dangerous. Even if it was successful, it would draw a line in the sand and likely make the Prime Minister of the Tsar's plans. However, if Mikhailov's bets pay off, Shipanov would have his machinations revealed publicly. Mikhailov knows that without sufficient civilian support that his plot could backfire intensely, however, he has ultimately decided that it will be worth it. Without sufficient civilian support, this plot could seriously go wrong for Mikhail. Um, ooh, maybe we'll wait to do that one. It's very low, so maybe we'll have to give it more time before we do stuff here, so. And next up we'll do... Mm, stability, I like stability. Uh, let's do this one next. Oppositional Remnants. While the Ar Imperial Army did well to trump the forces of our enemies on the field, it has proven frustrating in the aftermath of our victories that the most dedicated of our insurgents have not laid down their weapons. Commies bomb factories and cars in Irkutsk, peasants roam the far north shooting any char soldiers they can get their hands on, and fascist cells in Blag Blagovshevshenks and its environs lynch our administrators, leaving them hanging in public parks and outside their homes. This won't do. Increased patrols need to be imp implemented, and dissenters need to be shot or sent to labor camps. No more trials, no more leniency. They wouldn't extend the same courtesy to us, of course. Alright everyone, now Mikhail's day out.
Captain Igor eyed the Tsar with only a modicum of interest as he made a small talk with the factory workers. His instructions from the brass had been to make sure that the Tsar doesn't get too much into trouble, and it was less specific about the captain would have liked. What did they even define as trouble anyway? Igor figured it was likely one of those you know it when you see it scenarios, if nothing else. Resting his cheek against his fist, Igor began to notice something rather, rather particular about the Tsar. Babysitting Mikhail was nothing new to him, but this time there was something different about his mannerisms. He seemed energetic and talkative, and Igor could swear that this was the first time he ever saw the Tsar laugh with sincerity. It felt... wrong. The Tsar was a prisoner, and anyone who was anyone in his rump empire knew that that fact all too well. Mikhail was always a miserable sod, so why did he seem to have pep in his step today, and why did it not feel so right? The captain was broken out of the racing thoughts as Mikhail approached him, a smile still slathered across his face. All right, Igor, let's get out of here, shall we? Er, um, yes, of course, Your Majesty. Rising to accompany the Tsar outside, you couldn't help but notice the energy he had seen in him a minute ago was quite prevalent in his tone of voice as well. It was both heartwarming and unsettling to see him in such a mood, Ben. Igor knew that, if nothing else, it would make for an interesting antidote, or an antidote in the next report to the command. What's gotten into him? The weak link. And actually, what's, what else can we do here? Why do we have so much political power? What can we do, huh? Um, a Japanese stuff, which we can kind of ignore for now, probably. The weak link. I uh, thank you for coming on such short notice, General. I'm sure you've been quite busy indeed these days. Mikhail said as he graciously shook the hands of the guest of the evening, General Dmitry Volkogonov. As he sat by the Tsar's ornate dining table, Volkogonov noticed that the Minister of Finance was well was present as well. General, so good of you to join us. I've been meaning to talk to you in person for a while now. Volkogonov flashed a confused smile at Mikhailov. I appreciate the hospitality, sirs, but I'm not sure what we could possibly discuss that can't be worked out with my superiors. Leaning forward, Mikhailov continued, Oh, there's plenty, General. <clears throat> You've garnered a reputation as a man who tries to do the right thing, even if he has to go against the wishes of the brass, am I right? So the General's eyes narrowed, and what are you exactly saying? It's no secret that this empire chafes under the crushing influence of the White Army. That being said, that everyone in the military is corrupted, General. I believe that you are one of these men. You want me to go against Shepanov? I hope you realize that would be tantamount to insubordination. I'm afraid I'll have to report this. Witnessing Mikhail and his minister go white as a sheet, the general erupted into wheezing laughter. Not to worry, I only jest. That old fool is running this country into the ground and driving me mad in the process. Tell me where you need them, your majesty, and my men will be there. Quite a colorful character. I love it. Average and low support. I love low support, but I prefer medium support. But next up, we're going to do the Imperial Governing Committee. So we can do this, so we do this, so we do this stuff. So we can get down to Kurt Realization. Even though I would like to do that a lot. Ooh, I love the construction speed. Mm. But this doesn't help us getting rid of administrative bloat. So, as much as I would love to do that stuff so badly. Arr. Ah, the cultists, the fascists, and the reds. There are these three groups that still remain existential threats to our nation. The commies, cultists, and fascists. Each one of them has a unique flavor of danger. But all three represent an ongoing low-level insurgency following our conquest. That being said, we don't need to stand idly by as these terrorists and dissenters continue to bloody our streets and murder our supporters. We will fight them in the streets, draw the guerrillas out, and terrorize the terrorists. We cannot let them know that we are weak. We shall only respond to their terror with terror in kind. Good. Infrastructure. Um... I really don't... Uh, I might just wait for 10 days, hold on to our political power, see what we can do if this one comes back first, immediately, because I would really like to get this one back, because I love doing that stuff, so. Oppositional uh, remnants? Very nice, my friends. Very, very nice. Oh, yep, look at those guys. And three days left. Low support. Death of Ho Chi Minh. Goodbye, Ho Chi Minh. Also, off-screen, uh, we did get uh, equipment, so it did go up to the next level. It was going up by two a month. We were at Power Tools, but now we're here. So better. A banquet, my friends. I love banquets. I haven't been to many banquets, though. When it was first proclaimed, most people in the Far East regarded the Principality as an oddity. As a doomed attempt to restore Russian monarchism. The last gasp of an ever-shrieking clique of desperate old men. These people have been proven wrong with the return of the trappings of Empire to Siberia. So, too, did the activities of the distinguished bloodlines. Activities such as a banquet have been announced by the two scions of these very bloodlines. Attended by the rapidly expanding upper crust of Cheetah society. It had been announced as a refined engagement in support and praise of the Tsar in his efforts to expand the imperial lands. And as so many events in the old empire had been, however, it quickly deteriorated as the wine and liquor began to flow freely. The first activities the science organized were fairly tame. Cards and other games, a chance accompanied by heavy gambling, of course, as the level of inebriation increased. And as the wages grew, the competitions grew more intense with outcomes that would not be subsequently spoken of in polite society. Or polite company. By the night's end, several small fortunes have been won and lost, reputations have been built and tarnished, and as all the esteemed guests and the scions themselves could agree the next morning, a great time was had by all. At last, proper society returned to Cheetah, more like old Russia every single day, bread and games for all. Uh, are we missing resources that we need? Yeah, I guess we can do the resource extraction one, so that kind of sucks, but whatever. Increase loyalists. Is, is there anything that gives us greatly increased? No. It's just all the same, so. 
We got some of the political power. Hungary starts with Italy, so be it. And I don't want her to cost us this one. We're here to stay. Another brief pause in the extension of our administration outwards would lead one to examine all the progress that we've made in the past few months. For an administration whose territories were only held through the strength of a military fledging a functioning state, with provinces whose pacification is well underway and the administrations already bringing in reports. It may have been touch and go for a while, but now with the flames of insurgency dying down and an administration looking like it's been solidified, we can truly say that we are here to stay, my friends. We will stay here. We shall. And until we try to beat up the, mo the dudes to our west. The battle for Italy? Cool. Ah, look at this. Good. Anything else here? Still low support. Still low support. Anything else here? Poverty yet? I want to do this so badly, but I want to get this done fast. As fast as possible. Screw it. We're going to do one of these. I'm going to do it for higher point instructors. Screw it. Why? Because this one's still going down anyways. And it's still going down. So. Oh! Ah! Oh, we have debt? Nope. We don't believe in that D word. <clears throat> getting our hands a little dirty, shall we? Boris Shipanov was not pleased. It had been several months since his armies had achieved victory over the Empire's foes, and yet, despite his best efforts, the lingering remnants of past enemies continued to find ways to become a thorn in his side. Today, he had called a meeting with the rest of the White Army's general staff to make the displeasure known. Gentlemen, please to explain to me how, after supposedly destroying our enemies, they, they are still out there killing our troops and giving me a headache in the process? There's no response, no doubt. Shipanov's generals were spending the silent moment formulating excuses rather than providing answers. I can assure you, sir, that while these insurgents' actions are indeed a pain, they are nothing to be worried about. General Mustafin's, Mustafin's tone did not exactly scream confidence. I predict that they are too insignificant to persist for too much longer, and they will fall apart on their own, given enough time. Pardon me, Elena, but I think that's BS and you know it. They're out there right now, killing our men and trying to undo all the hard work we've accomplished. And you're going to sit there and tell me that it's under control? Do you even have a clue what's going on? Silence again. Nobody wanted to be the next to face their superior's wrath. Well, it seems that you fools had the audacity to claim victory without finishing the war. That ends today. I want all of you to send your best men out to start making arrests. After this week, I don't even want to hear a peep of dissent. Understood? We will no longer suffer tra traitors on my watch. No more half measures. Hey, good. Nice. Everyone loves Mikhail. The Imperial Governing Committee. The same individuals who propose splitting up our territory into autonomous provinces have also come to propose a so-called gover Imperial Governing Committee, which would have the ultimate oversight over these provinces and take and take the strain of individual decisions off our government. The IGC would answer directly to us, but would make a considerable strain off our already overloaded ministers. This IGC is, as they say, a no-brainer. However, there's been some debate over how exactly implemented this committee will be. This has led to the increasingly worried split between the military hardliners who want to take control of it, and the quieter industrialists who seek to establish an IGC free from military experience. They just won't give up. Grigor's eyes darted from one end of the alley to the other, or alleyway to the other. He tried his best to look as though he was in control, but in reality he was terrified. Gone were the days when he and the rest of the, his companions and the Russian fascist party knew could act with impunity. His two friends, however, did not seem to share their same fear. Where's your Tsar now, Jew? You thought you could come through the, our part of town? We still run things around here, and no war is going to change that. Grigor's friends, clad in distinctive yet poorly maintained RFP uniforms, towered over a man on the ground. They dragged him off the streets and immediately began harassing him, just like in the old days. I just collect the census, the man cried. I'm not even Jewish. His, his pleas for clemency were met with a feroc ferocious barrage of kicks. A shout rang from behind Grigor. Drawing the attention of all three fascists, a pair of white army soldiers were approaching, weapons at the ready. The sight caused Grigor's stomach to turn. Slip away from him, the, the lead one called, and put your hands in the air now. Ah, oh, the dogs of the Tsars are finally here, barked one of Grigor's companions. We were just having a nice chat with one of your people. Grigor could feel death bearing upon, down upon him as he turned towards his friends. Wait. Hey, wait. We shouldn't... His thoughts and speeches were interrupted as one of his friends drew the weapon. Grigor didn't have enough time to call out before the soldiers fired. As the bullets tore through him and he fell to the ground, his face landed next to the man of the of the man his group has been terrorizing. Their war is over. Well, it's definitely one way to put him down. And we're here to stay? You bet we are. Anything else we can do here? Infrastructure? Nice. Ah, good. 20 and now 1. Nice, nice, nice. And debt? Let's keep cutting it down and improving our GDP. Hey, 5.7 is not bad. The Emperor's new clothes. Oh, yes. Mikhail was expected to attend a state meeting with some foreign diplomats later today, and he had yet to pick out the outfit. Unfortunately, it seems everyone else in Chile had noticed this fact as well, and ever since the Tsar had woken up, they had been hounding him with questions as to what his wardrobe would be. Even some of his generals have been participating in the discussions and debates, much to the Tsar's worry. Was his outfit really such a big deal? The stretch of this decision had left the Tsar paralyzed within his bedchamber. A variety of outfits lied up. Upon, all upon his bed. Some of the generals had argued that a simple quality suit would show modernity and was more appropriate for the meeting. Others had argued that the Tsar's outfit must displace proper glory. 
and the simple suit wouldn't make him appear mundane and bland. Mikhail had thought this a fairly accurate portrayal of the Tsar, but the Joseph ignored his thoughts on the matter. Maybe Mikhail's wife would know what outfit would work best, but she was still whirled away from him. Luckily for Mikhail, his paralysis was resolved by an ex exasperated Shipanov, who barged into his bedchamber, chose a fairly elaborate outfit, and threw the rest haphazardly into Mikhail's closet. He reminded Mikhail that he, he only had a few hours left to prepare, and slammed the door shut before he could respond. Mikhail couldn't even pick out his own outfit, and yet he was supposed to rule all of Russia. Have you tried simply going naked? That should shut him up. Ah... The birthday suit. Extend land grant after we do another land doctrine, shall we? Yes, we shall. Supply chain reinforcements, yes, please, and then extend the land grants. Now that with these provinces have been divided and that the Imperial Governing Committee founded, there comes a matter of who will actually govern these provinces and their various subregions. Shupanov has naturally assumed that all of the individual governors will be the loyal military officers that he's known for years. However, the unexpected voice of Ivan Mikhailov puts forward yet another option. The creation of so-called royal governors will be the civilians nominated to their positions. Regardless of the specifics of our decision, we need to finalize and codify the responsibilities and limitations of these new governors and then officially accept Send these land grants to the individuals chosen. Sounds like a good idea, my friends. And anything else here? Low? Well, we need more, so. Uh, I guess infrastructure? Yeah, I, we just gotta beeline through this. We need more influence as fast as possible, so. Nice. Back in the committee. With the recent establishment of the Imperial Governing Committee to the aid with the administrative matters of the Empire, a mad scramble for control over the new organization has already begun. The interest groups who dominate the political scene have had their eyes upon the committee, eager to pack it with their allies. Firstly are the industrialists, who represent the loyalists. This group mostly consists of wealthy aristocrats and businessmen and are keen to utilize the committee to expand their business interests in the Empire. Also among this group are close, close political allies and confidence of Tsar Mikhail II, and control over the committee would surely mean an expansion of the Crown's influence. On the other hand, Paul Politicians and military men allied to the White Army also seek to bring the IGC under their control. The majority of these men have connections to the White Army's general staff, and by extension, Army Chief of Staff Boris Shepanov. Should the IGC fall under the military's influence, Shepanov's power will once again be cemented over matters of state. Who shall dominate the committee? Uh, the military asserts? No. We're going to go with this one. Civilian line budget, civilian bias, civilian line budget with military bias. Uh, oh, yeah. The industrialists pack the committee. Good. Very good. And we shall read, finalize a new system. Well, it's far from perfect, as the new governors depart to the new territories to, to establish formally an administration that's more than what has previously been simple military occupation, the government based in Chita is optimistic about the future of the Far East under their control. The effort to, de to stabilize and administer our new land is not complete, however. Some outstanding earmarks and prior discussions, including the nature of a taxation and where the military can be housed, whether bullets or barracks, or billets or barracks, and seemingly dozens of other footnotes can now be dealt with. Shepanov has already called a council in which all these small issues can be dealt with, and our new system can be finalized. S. Namibog. Handing out grants, the time has come to decide who shall govern the administrative divisions laid out by the Imperial Governing Committee. Minister of Finance Ivan Mikhailov and Army Chief of Staff Bol Shepanov have butted heads over this critical decision, each submitting their own plans for how this country should be governed. Unsurprisingly, Shepanov's plan for allotting the grants heavily favors the military. If he were to have his way, the governors would largely consist of loyal military men. These hand-picked officers will be veteran confidants of Shepanov, with some of them serving him since the days of the Russian Civil War. Ivan Mikhailov's plan, on the other hand, heavily favors loyalists. Mikhailov believes that the royal governors should be assigned the grants. These governors will be elected from amongst the civilians of the empire rather than from the white army. In the end, which one of these men will get their way? Land grants royal governors. Slightly decreased military influence versus the administrative divisions fall under control of the military governors. Well, it's cool as that would be. I think you need this one. Slightly more monthly population as well as consumer goods factories goes down. Sign us up, my friends. We can release more manpower. Then again, I should really stop cutting the military budget to get more manpower, but it is what it is. And right now, we currently have average loyalist influence, which is more than the militarists. I'm not sure how long it will take for us to get to high influence, but we're finalizing the new system, which is good. And then, oop, Burgundy and Bonkas pull back the curtain. Well, we should do this one now. Um, without civili sufficient civilian support, this could go really wrong for us. I mean, it's average. Maybe we wait just a little bit longer to go with that one. I don't want to do this one yet. Um, ooh, I want to... Uh, arm XP. Let's get the political power out, onwards and outwards. Now that we've triumphed over our rivals in the Far East, we can finally turn towards the rest of the world. There's a lot of issues that we can we still have to deal with in the immediate future, at least in terms of the international community. However, there are two paths ahead of us that we can are confident in taking to ensure that, at the very least, we see some interactivity with foreign powers. Firstly, we shall contact the Japanese, who have until this point been very favorable towards us in their dealings as they've been in the past years. 
Secondly, as legacy of the white movement in Haben were known internationally as of one, if not the only true successor of the, to the Russian Empire to, among the Russian emigres across the world, we should play to our advantages and invite both the Japanese and emigres, the former, to recognize us officially in the light of further assistance in lobbying for further international approval, as well as providing additional benefits for us when they finally return home to us, which is a good thing. Also, uh, off-screen, uh, South Africa is in a second civil war. Have fun, guys. Have fun. And the big ol' Africa stat was Zanu Zimbabwe already here. Oh, well. Good. More influence. Ah, I love GDP growth. Uh, we want to do that for the PP. And then I'm probably going to go ahead and do... I don't want to do this because it hurts our budget, but it's not enough for a military to enforce order, for it had to continue doing just that. We would have no troops to look westwards when the time is right. Indeed, many of the high commander are just as frustrated as our loyal civilians are when it comes to ongoing insurgencies that have plagued us since we defeated our enemies on the field. However, it appears that the solution is in sight. A group of younger officers have proposed an interior pacification organization, which the top press has run with and restructured into what is essentially a secret police. This organization, known as the Imperial Department for Order and Secur Security, or IDOS, will be the ones primarily responsible for dealing with these insurgencies and their fallout. Recruiting from the least ideologically corrupted members of the communist and fascist secret polices, the High Command expects that IDOS will be able to effectively counter these insurgencies, which gives us more daily political power, a little more stability, but the cost for it as a, a little higher. But let's see, can we do anything else here? No, we cannot. So maybe that's all we can do. We have to do everything else first. Oh, I don't know. Ah, very good, my friends. Also, there's another comment saying that we should play as the nation of West Alaska. Technically, I think I already did, and that's with, I think, Verbal. I could be wrong, but Verbal, Verbal was a lot of fun. Uh, let's try it anyways. Pull back the curtain. I think I already read this one, so without sufficient civilian support. I mean, we have average support, so it could go really wrong. And we have more support than the military, so. Greatly increased loyalist influence, which is good. So, that'll be very good. We're done here, so, pretty much. Oh, what do we want here? Heavy machinery. Equipment slowly improve. Where did army XP or army professionalism? Slowly improve by getting a military factory. Infrastructure would be really nice. Get some more fuel would be really nice. Milky manpower. Actually, that's not bad for consumer goods. You lose stability, but you get more war support. Well, let's go with the tried and true one. Oh, this one. There you go. Invest in construction. I'd love to do this one, too, but... Oh, well. Expertise, agriculture. There it is. Cool. Fire rate is slowly not going down as much. <laughs> Still going up slightly. Oh, agriculture is going to improve very soon, hopefully, as well. That'd be very, very nice. I love the budget. And we're still building more cities. So, tw 26. That's getting there. Hope you're having a great year, guys. We have 17 divisions over here and two more over here. And also, off screen, I did select up someone else. How much money are we losing now? Actually, that's not too bad. That's actually not bad at all. Nice. We have a little bit more interest here, but, you know, whatever. A little more debt, whatever. Um, what do we have? Let's pull back the curtain, shall we? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And we have average support, and we can't get any more, so that's okay with us. Uh, like I said, off-screen... Ooh, come back to her. I made these guys 40 combat with, or at least we'll have the ability to have 40 combat with, as well as basically 40 combat with tanks, so... Hopefully we'll make some. We're probably out of tanks, but now... Yeah, we need... Ooh... Let's go with five. Uh, we can lower it by one, maybe for now. Go back up to, to two, though. And put you uh, above there as well. We have enough APCs. Go down to four and four for now. There you go. In any case, go back to five and five. Okay, come back to her. The warehouse was filled with a buzzing tension that always filled the Saplinite headquarters. The prospect of a white crackdown was never far from the minds of those assembled, and each and every member of the underground had sworn oaths both to one another and to absolute secrecy. How then did the Okrana know exactly where to find him? The door flew off the hinges as the Tsar's death squad stormed inside of the Sablonet, scrambling for the weapons. Vasily, Katya, and Boris died in the first few seconds. L soft long hearts and hard heads bloomed like dripping roses in answer to the Tsar's bullets. Then errant round tore through the portrait of Salvin that stood at the end of the table, shattering a glass unheard in the rout of gunfire. The Leninists fought back, firing wildly with pistols and cheap SMGs, crouching behind the overturned tables. Others attempted to flee. The last thing they saw before running into the snow were the hollow and betrayed faces of the comrades who loved them above all else, all else and others. The operation was a tremendous success. Every communist bandit was accounted for, either dead or in the tender clutches of the Okrana. Blood dripped down under the fallen portraits. If anyone had bothered to look, they might have thought Sablin was weeping blood. The white terror returns. Love it. Average? Low? We'll get higher? Higher, higher, please. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 5%... Uh, actually, 35 days. Weekly stability. So, 5 weeks. For 5 weeks. 7% more stability. That's not bad, but... Eh. 
I really don't mind doing that one, maybe. Like, consumer goods, I would love to build, build, build faster, faster, faster. But societal development, cool. After this one, we'll probably do a realization. But now both Mikhail II and Boris Shepinov have realized that they're plotting against one another. This unpleasant realization has come with a timer. Both men begin to finalize what they can and win over all the assistance that up that they can muster up. As the stormy clouds of conflict descend upon a once quite cheetah, both the Tsar and the Prime Minister have been mob begun mobilizing their forces against one another in what seems to be conflict akin to the drama that played out in October 1917, the Corner Love Affair. Despite neither side being consciously aware of it, this front confrontation will decide the future of the white movement in the Far East. More stability, or more war support. Very good. Nice. A statement of intentions. So, I guess we have to do all these and you can't do any more here, so... Whatever. Um, I don't want to do this one first. We'll do that one. We'll have to do that one. A statement of intentions. It had been a long time, indeed, since so many eyes were on Mikhail II. Before, it was a whole host of unscrupulous men thinking excitedly of all the ways they could manipulate their new puppet. This time, however, it was different. The audience before Mikhail was of real, genuine allies who saw him as how a monarch should be, a beacon of unity made flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, in this room are people of varying stripes and backgrounds. Some of you are businessmen who drove this empire's great industry forward even in times of hardship. Some of you are politicians who seek only to represent their constituents to the best of their abilities. A few of you are officers of the White Army, the very same force that once bravely defied the Soviet usurper so long ago. Despite these very stark contrasts between you all, you have come here united behind a singular purpose to take back our country from the selfish and corrupt generals who seek to transform this ancient and glorious empire into nothing more than a quasi-fascist stratocracy. With me is their helpless puppet. I am speaking, of course, of Prime Minister Bolshevinov. The man likes to think he has us in his iron grip, but he will soon discover that he isn't as nearly as clever as he thinks he is. Despite our differences, we will fight side by side to remove this aspiring tyrant from our midst and continue the journey towards reunification. God save Russia, one and indivisible. The applause was overwhelming, and Mikhail would have been eager to bask in his newfound glory. And in the back of his mind, however, he couldn't help but worry that his captors may be listening. A bold speech, but for a bold time, Yelena. Ludmilla. Ivanov. Voroshilov. Uh, I'll go with Ivanov then. Cool. And it is 66, so we're doing this one. We need more max factories in the state. I'll be honest, it feels like we're really pushing pretty far into this uh, campaign so far. This is episode 3? 2? No, 4? I can't remember, but we're, we're trucking through it. I guess, then again, the campaign I did before this one was playing as America, and usually that takes a while, so. And it looks like the WRF probably has united the uh, very far western side. Yep, West Russia. Cool. Good job, guys. I guess. I guess. Yeah. Even more equipment. Oh, uh, oh, that's military factory construction piece. But we're not even using that. Mm, I don't care. I'm going to click it anyways. Oh, Omsk. Hopefully they can do well. Unless they've already fallen apart. Yazov. Well, he's doing what he's doing. And then making a play. When the time comes, of course. Uh, will you support us? Of course, my Tsar, with my body and with my blood. Remember, Ivan, you owe me one. Of course, Prime Minister Shepanov, I will be there when you need me. Both the Tsar's loyalists and the military have begun making plays against one another in preparation for the inevitable confrontation that neither side will know where or when it will happen. The only thing either side is sure of is that when it does happen, they'll be ready. And decrease military influence, nice. The curtain rises. Darn you, Kosov, I wanted results, not excuses. Ball shipping off, balked into his phone, his grip tightening against the plastic. I understand, sir, but I just can't help pull evidence out of my booty. Whoever stole those weapons covered their tracks well. Too well for us to pursue this lead any longer. That is not to say, though, that we're completely empty-handed. Shipping off, raising an eyebrow, go on and listening. Something interesting came up while we were chasing ghosts in Irkutsk. Apparently. Some very curious individuals have been reported meeting, making repeat visits to the Tsar's Dhaka. I look into it, and it turns out they're all friends of Ivan Mikhailov. The general went silent. The Minister of Finance had long been a pain in his booty. But as of late, he's been eerily calm. Did this news have anything to do with that? What business did he or his industrious friends have with the Tsar Mikhail anyway? And why didn't any of this feel right? Sir, are you there? Are you there? Are you okay? Yes, I want you to look into Mikhailov's connection. Find out what he's up to and figure out what's going on at those meetings. Don't screw this up, Kosov. You can count on it, sir. With that, Shepanov put the phone back into place. Finally, he had a solid lead. If Mikhailov and the Tsar were up to no good, he was going to find out one way or another. The walls begin to close on in. Very cool. And we still get 1.7 a day. God dang, I love it. That's actually awesome. Ah, oh, the rude awakening. When Bol Shepanov awoke to the shrill sound of ringing, he was immediately surprised to find it was still nearly pitch black in his room. The cacophonous ringing was not coming from his alarm clock, but from the phone by his nightstand. Muttering incoherently as he rose from bed, the half-conscious Shepanov stumbled clumsily through the dark towards the phone, not even bothering to turn on the lights. Who the bad word is this? Do you have any idea how late it is? If you'd like to read about agricultural methods, please go right ahead. Uh, let's see... 
Apologies, sir. It's close enough. I have information on the Mikhailov case that you'll want to hear. And you just couldn't wait until morning to tell me, shipping offside? Just tell me what you've learned. I've just received a report from the Krona, and it's rather conclusive. There's no doubt that it, that Mikhailov and his allies have been behind all the recent incidents lately. Worse still, we have reason to believe that he's in league with the Tsar for some kind of action against the government. I'll have the full report for you tomorrow. Shipanov fell to shiver, and it wasn't from the cold. Very well, Kosov. Keep up the good work. As he returned to bed, the old general found it rather hard to return to a slumber. He just learned that the nucleus of his movement was now potentially plotting against him. After all his hard work, it seemed that White Russia was ready poised to tear itself apart. When the sun rose that morning, Shipanov had not managed to get any more rest. His greatest challenge was yet to, uh, was close at hand. The future of Russia will be decided. Shoring up support. Uh, shoring up support. With the upcoming confrontation seemingly inve inevitable, both sides are scrambling to shore up their support bases, ensuring that the loyalty of their allies and trying desperately to get anyone on their side. As the clock ticks closer and closer to midnight, both the Tsarists and the military loyalists are able to take action, and this is an opportunity for both sides to shore up their final opportunities and ensure that they're ready for when the confrontation comes. Have you been able to get in contact with their beneficiary? Yes, my Tsar. He says that it won't be cheap, but he can get it done. Prime Minister Shepanov, our ally, Yeton, Yethontov, has mentioned that he's able to get his job done. Excellent. Thank you. Oh boy. So we have one left. We'll save that for later. Let's keep focusing on some more of this stuff. Anyways, output is really good to get. So, alright. Get down that debt. Seems to be going up a little bit more, which I don't like. Oh, and here we go. Anything up here? Nope. So you, you can only take each one one time, which is totally fine with me. Whatever. Um, what do we want? Academic base, research facilities, expertise. A bonus for industry. Yeah, I'm taking that bonus for industry. Expertise is pretty weak, in my opinion. It's not terrible, but... It's probably, it's okay. It's not great in my mind, but whatever. Um, well, that bonus for industry will help save us time for when we do research stuff for industry, obviously. So, And saving time, especially in the Warlord era, can be very, very beneficial. Just because you never know uh, when you, well, you kind of do know when you're going to go to war. Wow, we don't have a lot of manpower. But, like, time is money. And saving up time is always super, 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 super good. Alright, my friends. Oh, did they come up? No. I'm going crazy, my friends. Ah, oh, peace conference is over. Oh, there goes Moscow autonomy. It makes sense. A game plan. Well, General Volkogonov's units will overrun and take control of the government apparatus in every major city and cripple their ability to respond quickly enough. With the guns we procured, we might even be able to arm some paramilitaries to stick up, pick up the slack. Volkogonov stared at the map he and the others stood around with narrow eyes. His arms crossed. Apologies, Mikhailov, but I think you're forgetting something. Ship enough still outnumbers us by a significant margin. Even with my units in play and those of anyone else I can convince to join us, we're not in a good position here. I agree, I agree with the general, Mikhailov, the Tsar began. We can't just begin to occupy every city with Shipanov as such an advantage. I have a feeling we're inviting disaster. Mikhailov said as he stepped away from the map. All due respect, gentlemen, but the disaster is assured if we start getting pessimistic like this. Shipanov may have more troops, yes, but we have the element of surprise. If we strike hard and fast enough, that bald dude won't even know what's happening until it's too late. Volkogonov shot a concerned glance in Mikhail's direction and was men in kind. The Minister of Finance was nothing if not motivated, but the other two were beginning to wonder just how well he understood the realities of the situation. The plotters had gathered quite a following, but would it be enough in the face of the White Army's overwhelming might? Perhaps a plan B is in order? How about the final preparations? Prime Minister, we've been able to con contact Villain. He's confirmed that he's ready to fight you, or fight when you need him to. My Tsar, Commander Turgenov, has affirmed his loyalty to the cause. When the time comes, he will be with us. The end draws near. The Prime Minister has secured his power base and is prepared for the march upon the Imperial Palace. Meanwhile, the Tsar waits with bated breath to see if his support will ever come. The future of not only the Principality, but all of Russia hangs in the balance. Low and average, so. Um, what do we want here? Poverty. Poverty, 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 poverty. We do not want poverty, but we want to cut that poverty down. Yep, the debt is going up more and more. Oh, stupid interest rates. But at least our growth is doing okay. Ah, oh, special training is gone, huh? Even less military influence. Shoring up support, my friends. Trouble is brewing in the government. And tensions between the civilian and military sectors are rapidly approaching a climax. Despite its appearances, the dominance of the White Army in the affairs of the state is not nearly as strong as it once was, ever since the death of Ataman Semenyov. The military's influence has grown more tenuous by the day. Opportunistic statesmen circle like vultures and rally around the Tsar. One man they believe they can spearhead their intentions of breaking the tight string hold the White Army has over the state. With the support of a clique of young officers and backing of Ivan Mikhailov, the Tsar conspires to seize control over the government and reaffirm his status as the absolute authority of the Russian state in both name and intent. 
While they have the backing of wealthy aristocrats and industrialists on their side, there are growing worries that the scheme is doomed to fail without proper support from the military elements. The White Army and the Chief of Staff Bull Shipping up on the other hand are aware that something is amiss. While they do not still have conclusive evidence that the Tsar is conspiring against them, they are at very least suspicious enough to prepare for the print of action against potential dis dissidents. Contingency plans are being drawn up and the White Army remains on high alert sooner or later. One faction will move against the other and the destiny of the White Movement shall be decided. Increase military influence? Decrease. Decrease military influence. That is good for us. Because now they're very low? Good. Unlock? Sure. Oh, there's nothing there. Okay. Nothing there. Okay, good. A quiet dinner, my friends. A deathly silence has fallen upon the city of Cheetah, where political machinations have begun to abound. Rumors about the Tsar awakening to his duties and struggling against the will of the military proliferate. Whispers move along the people, and some worried, some curious, and even some excited. For the Tsar and his long suffering supporter, Ivan Mikhailov, however, their nerves were frayed. The pair sat down to dinner ostensibly to discuss the future in the Imperial Palace of Cheetah, while Boris Shepanov mustered the local garrison under the control of Volkovkanov to march on the palace and arrest the plotters. The de deafening quiet in the Tsar's dining room paralleled the silent, <clears throat> uh, silent, tense march of the Cheetah garrison as both headed towards the climax of the long-awaited confrontation between the monarch and the military. This evening, the fate of the White Russia or White Movement will be decided. Local garrison. Also, Volkogonov has been summoned to do the duty. So, Zlatal shatters Western Siberia. Oh boy. They took out Omsk. Oh boy, that is so sad. Oh, who are you? Ops Reconstruction Authority. Who are you? Viktor Grigoriev? Huh. That's kind of cool. Alright. I haven't seen that one before. Alright, so all we can get up to is average, which kind of sucks, but it's much better than everyone else. So, Academic base. Uh, yeah, I guess. Academic base? Why not? As long as it's all going up, except for poverty. But poverty will go up too, eventually. So, A quiet dinner, and then after all that stuff is done, the stage is set. Despite his unfortunate circumstances, Mikhail began to feel less and less like a prisoner with each passing day. He still wasn't allowed to leave the DACA very often, but he took some solace in the fact that perhaps it wouldn't stay that way for long. Indeed, his harebrained scheme to take his rightful place at Tsar hatched with the Minister of Finance was finally coming to fruition. Even now, loyal Watt Army units under Vol General Volkogonov were preparing for the moment when the die would be cast and Mikhail would make his move against his captor. However, Mikhail had also grown no less nervous over the outcome of the coup. The General, too, had expressed doubts on the feasibility of the plot, especially under such a short window of time. What if Volkogonov was right. What if Mikhailov's plan was too bold to work, and Shepanov's clique was able to leverage a considerable numerical advantage to regain the initiative? Worse still, what would become of Mikhail should the plan fail? Would Shepanov take pity upon him and send him home, or did he have a more violent fate in mind? These questions are more weighted, and more weighed heavily on the captive Tart's mind. Perhaps he thought he simply had spent too much time preparing and overthinking variables that were out of his control. Maybe it was time to kick back and breathe easy for a while. It had been some time since Mikhailov had, or Mikhail had invited Ivan Mikhailov over for dinner. A quiet evening amongst friends might just be what his weary mind needed. A chance to take a breather, which is always good. Ooh, civilian factories and infrastructure. Ooh, we get more political power. I like that. I want to expand this a bit more factories and build stuff faster. I think so. IDC. Since its establishment, the Imperial Development Company has been proven to be a great boon to our efforts to transform the wastelands outside Cheetah into something resembling a nation, industrialized and, and or modern industrialized nation. Now, however, our borders have grown to encompass the entire Russian Far East and the IDC as it cannot effectively expand the operations to the rest of the region. Perhaps a state-sponsored expansion of the IDC is in order. With the help of some generous financial investments from the Tsar himself, the IDC will be expanded far beyond their previous capabilities. With the government's aid, we will be able to get the most out of the Far East's hidden industrial potential. Good. And now, I could cut down the budget some more, and we still will, but let's do that one, too. Uh, we are mobilizing slightly more, so keep expanding that. Cut that down. Um, I'm not going to cut the, that yet. I want to get this map because we need as much map as we possibly can get right now. So let's do that one more time and start training some of these guys. That would be important. There you go. Cool. A quiet dinner, my friends. A quiet dinner. Oh, oh the thing went away. Mikhail stared down and ate his soup, his avatar having left him. Despite his best efforts, he could not stop thinking about everything that could go wrong. The Tsar's guest for the evening, Ivan Mikhailov, clearly still possessed his own appetite, but even the usually chatty minister was abnormally somber today. Your Majesty, he began, looking at him. You must eat. I cannot afford to have you starve. Now there's so much to do. Seeing the look the Tsar gave him, Mikhailovich continued. Do not worry yourself, my liege. Everything is in motion, and all that remains now is to have faith in our success. Mikhailov set his spoon down, and as he did so, both men noticed that 
it, along with all the other silverware, began to vibrate. From outside, a deep rumbling could be heard, and both Mikhail and Mikhailov rose in unison to investigate, their minds beginning to race. Pulling aside the curtains, they were greeted with a sight that made their bloods run cold. Trucks and armored carriers disgorged dozens of soldiers with the, with the insignia of the city garrison, and they were moving to encircle the residence. And if at the front gate, Borshepinov himself stood by while an enraged, an enraged subordinate screamed at the guard commander. The men backed away from the window and looked at each other. That's it then, isn't it? The star said, his voice, his voice in your whisper. Shepinov's found us up. We've arrived at the precipice. Oh boy. In the meantime, richest facilities? Why not? The end of an era, my friends. Bull Shepinov sternly examined the scene that lay before him. His troops had the Tsar's Daka utterly surrounded. The rats were cornered in the hole. Only a token force of Imperial Honor Guard and a few conscientious young officers stood between him and those who had conspired against the seat. The old general prepared to make his intentions known. <clears throat> Attention, all those who serve the Tsar. We are here only to execute the will of the Russian state. Mikhail Andreevich has thrown his lot in with the treasonous elements. <coughs> Excuse me. And has forsaken his holy vows to protect Russia and her people. Stand down at once. The Tsar's loyalists do not budge. Shipanov cannot take their defiance any longer. Enough of this, Foss. General Volkogonov, order your men to attack. This ends today. No, I'm afraid I can't do that, sir. What the bad word? Turning to face a subordinate, he was met instead with the barrel of a gun. Volkogonov had his sidearm pointing directly at his face. What? What the heck do you think you're doing, General? Shipanov's voice, usually stern and decisive, now bore a rarely seen panic. Boris Shipanov, in the name of his Imperial Majesty, Mikhail II, I am placing you under arrest. Shipanov's world was turned upside down in only a few seconds. Volkogonov's soldiers had turned their sights inwards and began violently detaining any recent units present. Present, who answered to Shepanov. You too, Volganov. No, this can't be. Word had finally failed him. The Prime Minister and Commander of the White Army, formerly the most powerful man in the Empire, felt his knees give out as soldiers cuffed his hands. Almost as soon as it had begun, his ironclad reign had come to an end. The chains are broken, my friends. Mikhail, you are no longer our reluctant Tsar, but you are now our glorious leader. Are we still mobilizing? Good. We're going to mobilize as much as we can, use up all the manpower that we have, and then cut down military spending again. That's the plan. Cool. We have done it, my friends. There will be no traitors in our midst. But too bad we lost a good general, though. That sucks. That really sucks. <clears throat> but that just means time for promotion. Ooh. Uh, uh, Abramov, you're already a general. Uh, Leonid, you're already leading them. So, Dimitri, you know what? You deserve a promotion. I don't even care. You deserve a promotion for what you've done here. There you go. You can be offensive. And a guerrilla fighter. Charismatic. Let's, let's reinforce as fast as possible. How about that? There we go, my friends. We've done it. Hopefully. Oh, we're, I'm, I'm glad we cut this down. Uh, actually, I would like to do stuff improve relations by small amount. We're already pretty high. Toad, uh, electronics. This stuff would be good, but anything else here? We can build infrastructure much faster. Fuel, chromium, and tungsten. And actually, we could really use that tungsten. And even more fuel would be nice. So I don't ever choose this one, but we'll do it. Why not? Expand the IDC. Uh, I have I have great confidence now. I'm, I'm enjoying this campaign. I'm really enjoying it. Riches in the Far East. Let's get some more slots. Clearing a path. When the Whites had first arrived in Cheetah, there was a sm but a small beacon of Russian civilization surrounded by vast ranges of uninhabitable wasteland that stretched farther down than the eye could see. After the establishment of the Imperial Development Company and their reclamation campaign, we were able to turn it into something more, far more usable. The result speaks for themselves, and it is only natural that we look to the rest of our newly acquired lands to give them the same treatment. Therefore, a massive reclamation effort shall begin to conclude, or con continue, what we started in Cheetah and clear more space for our construction projects, one way or another. Siberian wastes will be tamed. Alright, so we're done with that. Cut it down. Nice. Transform the wastes. Ooh, penal. I love penal labor. Riches of the Far East, shall we? The Far East has long been the poorest, most sparsely populated region of Russia. With no real economy to speak of, we will have to get creative and make the best of what is available. Despite appearances, this long-neglected region has much to offer, hidden beneath the frozen soil. And the Siberian permafrost lies a great bounty of natural wealth, the vast majority of which has gone unclaimed for centuries. Were the control over the region secure? Unearthing these underground treasures must become an absolute priority. Existing infrastructure will be adapted to our purposes, and extensive mining operations will be established in the region that have long been overlooked. The riches hidden beneath this earth shall be laid bare, submitting a mastery over the unruly Russian at Far East. Both of an industry would be nice. Uh, nice, a new Siberia. Well, I'm just looking at this stuff because because I want to get down to this stuff. Expertise, increased GDP. I'm just looking at this just because poverty rate will improve, and that's nice as well. Um, actually, what is this one? Purchase a lot of industrial equipment. I want to go down here, Lessons of War, because this stuff is not bad either. Army Professional goes up as well. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Love it. But there's a lot of blueprints down here as well. And down here, just, I love all the development that we can get, but. The New Siberia. 
Kirill grunted as he sat down, one of the few opportunities he had to rest after a long day of work. From this elevated position, he could clearly see the results of the day's labor. Vast ranges of landscape deprived of trees as far as his eyes could see, and the place were stumps much like the ones he was now using as a seat. Here he was, the son of a Siberian wilderness and her natural bounties, doing now the bidding of the very men he once tried to resist. Although the pay was very good, Kirill still wondered if it was worth selling his soul and helping them to destroy the forest similar to the ones he once called home. As Kirill lit a cigarette, his mind continued to wander. Siberia was a vast land, but even the seemingly endless forests of a land like this were finite in the grand scheme of things. The Imperial Development Company tore into the wilderness like a pack of wolves, ripping down forests and transforming wild, wide tracts of wilderness into featureless plains of grass. Kirill wondered if, in the future, there would be, even be any forest left once the IDC was done. He had been born and raised a man of the wilds, living off the land and appreciated what nature had to offer. Civilization was overrated as far as Kirill was concerned, and he hoped that more people would come to appreciate his beauty. The problem with this was, however, was that the pay was no good. In the end, even a wild beast like Kirill was attempted by the IDC's offer of wealth. Far in the future, would Kirill's children be able to experience the same kind of life that he did once? Putting out a cigarette, Kirill sees his thoughts and headed off to end his shift for the day. The price of progress. Hopefully they can do some, you know, reforestation efforts. Because it's always good to do. You know, you don't want to cut everything down and make sure you can't, you know, rebuild stuff when you need to. I think it's a good idea to, you know, have some level of reforestation. But whatever. That's Maybe that's just me. And maybe we'll do one or two more focuses and we'll call it an episode. I'm looking at this. Uh, industry, resources. Uh, we will get to 1970. I don't... I want to get the bonus to electronics, but I want to say political power for this as well. Uh, war support would be nice. Weekly stability. Eh, construction speed. 15%. How are we doing with this construction speed? Not bad. Even though I would prefer a little bit faster construction speed right now. Um, You know what? That's just 35. We got enough political power. So we're going to lose 2.5 stability. Whatever. So when removed, we get some more war support as well. Consumer goods goes way up. And just in case, against that... Uh, let's see, these are all 25 versus 35. We get more, you're basically 5,000 more manpower, which is not bad, which would cover that. Good more construction speed. You get more war support additionally. Is there a cap on this? Yes, there is, it looks like. Um, well, this one's 10 more political power, but you do get 5,000 manpower. Now, 5,000 manpower is not going to mean much, but we could honestly probably use that, so. What that one, too? Cool. Rich is the Far East, the new favorite. Nothing immediately that we can use, so we'll just keep trying to beeline down here. Transforming the waste. The endless expanse of woodlands are slowly but surely being pushed back and transformed into something that can actually be made use of to the Empire. Great quantities of prime real estate have already been cleared for construction and exploitation, and all that remains now is to put it into use. These empty spaces will soon become the home to the Far East burgeoning industry. Once the proper infrastructure is developed, we can begin piling the new space with all sorts of productive enterprises. Factories, mines, and arms manufacturers shall be or the order of the day. Although we cannot ever hope to compete with the industrial centers further to the West, the results of our acclimation efforts do not look as bleak as they we previously assumed, and we will end with exploit the prisoners. As a consequence of the region being so lightly populated, a vast workforce isn't exactly something that's easily available to us. Our interest in exploiting the natural resources of the Far East and eventually beginning industrialization efforts will, will fall woefully short of the goals if we don't have a reliable labor pool to back them up. Our chief of staff, Boris Shepanov, is now gone, but has proposed a controversial solution. He believes that the vast number of prisoners taken during the wars to reunify the region are serving little use sitting in prison and can be better utilized by putting them to work. Although some concerned ministers have pointed out that such an idea would be immoral, it is worth remembering that these fascists and Bolsheviks would have done very well inflicted the same treatment upon us given the chance. But I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we cut down the debt, expand the GDP, and begin to fight the Grand Prince of Faulty of Central Siberia. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.